Welcome all, and thank you for joining us tonight for this event, Learning to Read Maine's Landscape Through the Lens of Racial History. We are gathering virtually tonight and are grateful, grateful for technology and recognize that this presents us with a few challenges. We are recording the event and we'll post this to our website shortly, sending all of you the link when it is ready. You are all, well, I thought I could mute you all, but I didn't figure out how to do that. So if you could all mute yourself, that would be great. Thank you. Um, and please feel free to turn off your video. We have set up the agenda tonight for the presentation to last for 45 minutes or so, and then we will have time for questions at the end. Please put your questions in the chat and I will make sure to collect them. Thank you again. As we settle in, I would like to acknowledge that we are in the homeland of the Wabanaki, the people of the place where the sun first looks our way. We make our acknowledgement aware of repeated and ongoing violations of sovereignty, territory, water, and sacred sites in the Wabanaki homeland. We extend our respect and gratitude to the many indigenous people who are here now and their ancestors whose rich histories and vibrant communities include the Abenaki, Malisee, Mi'kmaq, Passamaquoddy, and Penobscot nations and all the native communities who have lived here for over 3000 generations in right relationship with this place that is now called Maine. In preparing for tonight, I was drawn to this quote from nature writer J. Drew Lanham. Efforts at good beget better when they converge. Yes, birds of a feather may flock together Yet sometimes the most beautiful aggregations come not from birds of a feather flocking together, but from murmurations of difference, from diverse assemblages moving in a flowing unison that began with an individual deciding to be part of a greater whole. Oops, I'm just, sorry, I'm just admitting. There we go. In this essay, a convergent, a, a convergent imagining, J. Drew Lanham goes on to imagine Rachel Carson and Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. conversing through letters about the alignment and convergence of the environmental movement and the racial justice movement. We conservationists, environmentalists, have a role and a responsibility to participate in social and racial justice. And I am inspired by the number of people that have signed up for tonight, almost 100. The Southern Maine Conservation Collaborative is a network of land and water conservation organizations committed to working together. We are dedicated to expanding the definition, practice, and impact of land and water conservation by exploring the essential intersections presented to us. Tonight, I am excited by our partnership with Atlantic Black Box to bring this learning experience to all of us. Atlantic Black Box empowers communities throughout New England to embark on their own unique journeys of historical recovery. Mobilizing a vast coalition of scholars, museum specialists, educators, community leaders, engaged artists, genealogists, racial justice activists, archivists, and descendants, we Atlantic Black Box supports individuals and institutions in the work of unearthing and reckoning with our region's fraught history of complicity in the global slave trade and the economy of enslavement. As conservationists, we are connected to our places so deeply and we pledge to our communities to steward these special places. As such, it is also our responsibility to interpret and be the voice for these places. We have an opportunity to bring this hidden history to light, and I look forward now to learning how to do that. And so please join me in welcoming Meadow Dibble and Kate McMahon. Meadow Dibble is the founding director of Atlantic Black Box, a public history project devoted to researching and reckoning with New England's role in the slave trade and the economy of enslavement. Currently a visiting scholar at Brown University's Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, she received her PhD from Brown's Department of French with a focus on post-colonial studies and taught Francophone African literature at Colby College from 2005 to 2008. Originally from Cape Cod, Meadow lived for six years on Senegal's Cape Verde Peninsula prior to pursuing her graduate studies. There, she published a cultural magazine and coordinated foreign study programs. 
in collaboration with the team that produces Teaching Hard History, the Southern Poverty Law Center's flagship podcast. She is currently developing the Diseased Ship podcast with support from the Maine Humanities Council. Meadow has been serving as editor of the International Educator newspaper since 2014. And Kate McMahon is, the, is a museum specialist at the National Museum of African American History and Culture and leads research efforts at the Center for the Study of Global Slavery. She received her BA in Art History and MA in American and New England Studies from the University of Southern Maine. She completed her PhD in History at Howard University in 2017. Her dissertation was entitled, The Transnational Dimensions of Africans and African Americans in Northern New England, 1776 to 1865. Her current research explores New England's connections to and complicity in the illegal slave trade and, colonials, and colonialism, 1809 to 1900. She is committed to exploring the living legacies of slavery and the slave trade in the present day and interpreting this history for a broad public through frequent public speaking engagements and scholarly production. Thank you, thank you, thank you all for joining us. And um, I will now pass it over to Meadow. Thank you, Jessica. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here tonight with all of you um, and with my friend and uh, partner, Kate McMahon. Um, this, is, this is a real tremendous opportunity for us. Um, uh, believe so strongly that um, that our connection to place, our personal connection to place, uh, is understanding that is key to moving this, uh, driving this movement towards um, collective historical recovery. Um, I really look forward to um, the Q&A session because I, I think that this is most profitable when this is a conversation. Um, so I do hope that you will um, be, you know, thinking of uh, questions that you have from the ground, from your own communities um, to, to bring into conversation with us um, after we make some initial remarks. Um, my own, intervention here tonight is going to be a little um, different than usual. Um, I uh, wanted to take more of a personal tack um, than in presentations past, call it, um, you know, uh, after a long month of, of, of Zooming uh, nonstop, um, just mixing it up a bit, but also um, I think because, uh, because this history we feel is personal. We need to take this history personally. Um, and so I'm going to share uh, with you a, a bit about what I mean by that. Meadow, you're muted. <laughs> sorry, I did that. I did that. Oh. I'm sorry. How I'm long so sorry. have I been muted? <laughs> just, no, just no. like a minute. A sentence. <laughs> yeah. a sentence. Okay. Um. So I, I was, I, I was saying I've been thinking recently about uh, President Obama's wonderfully hopeful message um, that the arc of the moral universe bends toward justice, um, ultimately. Uh, Jonathan Capehart of the Washington Post this summer took a wide angle snapshot of the country's very fraught social and political landscape and felt compelled to counter Obama's reassuring words with an op-ed that he titled, um, that moral arc doesn't bend towards justice by itself. Decidedly not. In order for the thing to bend, people have to apply tremendous pressure and in a sustained way through committed action. Over the course of um, this past year, a global reckoning prompted by the Black Lives Matter movement has hammered home the fact that if it is indeed a just society that we want, it is not enough to not be racist. 
we have to be actively anti-racist. In this extraordinary moment we're experiencing, we have all witnessed, and many of us firsthand, the awesome power of collective action as people across the country and around the world have risen up to demand change. And we have seen that when people turn out en masse with persistence to push for change, it is in fact possible to affect major paradigm shifts. We can bend the arc if we're all working together. Atlantic Black Box has a good deal in common with the BLM movement. As a coalition, we too are committed to organizing collective action in service of racial justice and equity. And we too are looking to bend that arc. But whereas much of the anti-racist organizing happening to today pushes for changes to current policies as well it, it should, such as defunding the police, um, or making investments in housing, education, healthcare, environmental justice. Atlantic Black Box has identified a different site of critical intervention in the struggle for racial justice, and that is history. We are mobilizing a grassroots historical recovery movement powered by citizen historians, you, and guided by a broad coalition of scholars, community leaders, educators, activists, artists, all of us, right? We all have something to bring to this effort. So yeah, we are crowdsourcing history in the way that you may have um, come to understand uh, the role of the citizen scientist um, in relationship to the scientists that are sitting in their labs uh, or in their offices and can't possibly be out in the field collecting data in a massive way in order to understand these uh, trends such as um, bird migration or, or, or uh, butterfly populations. They call on citizen scientists to collect data in the field at the local level and feed it back to them. Um, and when we're talking about a black box, um, what, we're, what we're evoking is the notion of a repository of this kind, an online dynamic repository. Uh, and this is uh, the, you know, collecting facts is at the basis of our, what we call a historical recovery project, um, a region-wide historical recovery project. And recovery is truly the, the key word here because we believe we cannot collectively recover from the racism that plagues our society and reproduces these age old inequities that we've seen play out throughout the pandemic in particular until we've collectively worked to uncover New England's deeply repressed racial history. So we are working on multiple fronts. Um, we have five main areas of action. Uh, the uh, public history project or research aspect of our work being central. Um, education is connected to this because we really want to engage young people, um, students, as history detectives doing the work themselves to feed the, you know, this information into the black box. Um, but it's also important that we tell the stories. So um, media production is, you know, about finding ways, whether it's through podcasts or through blogs, um, creating a common platform where communities can come and share their stories, chronicle their, um, their, journeys of historical recovery. Um, storytelling is, is critical because it's about changing public perception um, and uh, public programming also, such as uh, the Remapping New England project that we currently have underway with our partners at Indigo Arts Alliance um, is a good example of that, um, where we are hosting a series of events that's really looking at how is 
this history represented on our landscape um, or how is it not, right? Um, what are artists doing to bring attention to this history? And advocacy, um, you may be familiar with, um, the, with the bills that Rachel Talbot Ross currently has um, underway, um, supporting efforts to change policy, um, to get uh, African-American studies mains Black studies, indigenous studies into the curriculum. Um, the, the, this is a critical aspect also of the work that we're looking to do. Um, but you may ask, you know, why uh, focus on the past when there is so much critical work to be done in the present? Um, and I do hope that we'll discuss that. Um, but quite simply, you know, if we're not proactively working to correct the historical record and tell a more inclusive story about what happened here, if we're not, um, you know, really investing in knowing uh, what happened here, who built this place, who were the members of this community, then we are in fact perpetuating these historical harms. Here in New England, we do not have Confederate statues to remind us of our racist past. And that is actually a handicap uh, for us on our own journey of historical recovery because the invisibility of our complicity, the fact that much of it, for example, took place overseas, offshore, has meant that we've been operating uh, for centuries on a false notion of our, our past. We have been passing down stories that are not based in fact, but rather fantasies about bracing adventures on the high seas, about righteous communities founded on democratic principles, about hardworking upright citizens who earned every penny they acquired. These are not false stories, they're incomplete stories. Because we've been ignoring a staggering pile of evidence that would contradict them and that would fly in the face of our region's dominant narrative um, in which a staunchly abolitionist North serves as a heroic foil to a slave holding racist backward South, right? Um, here in New England, on the contrary, you know, uh, this ugliness is not in full view, the ugliness of the exploitation, the expropriation, the dispossession, um, the oppression. It, what we have are wonderfully idyllic landscapes um, that we are very proud of and for, for, good, for good reason. Um, but, uh, ironically, you know, with, with all the efforts to preserve our history here in the Northeast and to conserve our environment, these precious natural spaces, ironically, it's right here that uh, we are arguably the most deluded about what happened on this land and who lived in these communities and what profits from what sorts of commerce went into constructing the built environment um, and in uh, rewriting the landscape. Um, simply put, here in New England, we do not know our history. We are alienated from it. And I realize this is a bold statement that many would take issue with. Um, but historians such as Kate McMahon uh, and her colleagues who are working in this emerging field of scholarship know enough to state with certainty that we have not been researching or discussing, discussing rather the most important thing there is to know about New England and that is its longstanding investment in what we refer to as the Atlantic world slave economy or the global economy of enslavement. 
And by this, we mean participation of Northern shipbuilders, seamen, merchants, and bankers in the transatlantic and domestic slave trades. Uh, also the enslavement of indigenous and African descended peoples throughout the Northeast right here. And importantly, the exploitation of enslaved labor through what was euphemistically referred to as the coasting um, or provisioning trade in connection with the brutal sugar plantations of the West Indies in South America, where captive Africans who managed to survive the brutal middle passage to the Americas had only a seven year life expectancy on arrival. We may have forgotten, but the land remembers. This is a bit of wisdom that was passed on to me by Ramona Peters, uh, a member of the Mashpee Wampanoag tribe, uh, the, uh, those, uh, the indigenous people whose ancestral homeland I grew up in uh, living you know, in uh, Cape Cod. Um, the land remembers. She said to me, Meadow, I get to say this because I'm indigenous. If you say it, um, people are, are, they might roll their eyes. But I believe this, uh, I believe this firmly. Um, Ramona, uh, when I had the wonderful chance to meet her, told me about an event that she participated in. In fact, she was central in uh, creating and launching, which is the Interfaith Pilgrimage of the Middle Passage, which took place in 1998 and 99, it was an attempt to heal the land. All of the places of the Atlantic world that were touched by this Atlantic world slavery, uh, a group came together uh, to walk that land and chant um, and pray um in solidarity connecting with communities along the way telling stories listening to stories um, in an effort to cleanse this land of the racial trauma of what occurred here um it's a fascinating story and i encourage everyone to um look it up if you're not familiar uh the the pagoda, the P New England Peace Pagoda uh, from which this group um, departed was right in Leverett, Mass. And the archives uh, of the, the interfaith pilgrimage um, are right there in Massachusetts as well. Um, I mentioned this because earlier I was talking about the necessity of collective action to bend the arc of the moral universe towards justice. This is an extraordinary group of people um, who gave some of them a full year of their lives and walked for um, dozens of miles every day in an effort to make a difference, to, to bring attention to this history and cleanse and heal the land. Um, we need to make a similar investment Maybe not all of us can leave for a year on such a, a pilgrimage, but what can we do right here where we are? How can we invest what is most precious to us, which is not our money, but our time, our interest, our curiosity, you know, our intellectual capacities, our skills? How can we invest those in? seeking to know where we are, what happened here, who we are in relation to these places that we claim we love. If we don't make that investment, I ask you, and I am sort of on a soapbox here and you know, forgive me, but um, do we really deeply love the places that we claim we do if we don't care to know them? 
if we think about this, um, you know, as a relationship, as with another human being, I mean, do we really love a person who we don't care to truly know deeply? Um, I wanted to play for you a short clip from um, an interview that Kate and I did actually, or it, uh, that I conducted um, in Kate's office at the Smithsonian back when such things were possible. This was, uh, this was really glorious. Um, this is our friend Katrina Brown, uh, who discovered that her family, the DeWolf family of Rhode Island, were in fact the most prominent prolific slave traders of all slave trading happening under the American flag. And as soon as she made that discovery when she was in her 20s in college, the very next thing she realized is that she'd actually known this all along. That information about her family's involvement in the slave trade was in her consciousness, but it was very, very deep. Um, so let's just listen to Katrina. This is just an excerpt from our interview. Um, and do let me know if you can't hear. At one point in, in one of your documents, you talk about, yeah, like a reorganization of your brain that was required as you were, pulling up this information and trying to process it. Can you talk about that a bit? What that felt like, what it required on your part, how long it took or is taking? It's taking. Yeah, it's taking. Um, it still feels ongoing. Um, one concrete example that comes to mind is uh, taking Amtrak along the Northeast Corridor, which I did frequently both prior to this project and during this project and just my whole adult life. Basically, I grew up in Philadelphia. I've lived in DC, I've lived in Boston. I've had occasion to go to New York for work my whole life, um, meetings. Um, so with this learning that not only did the North dominate the slave trade, but there was slavery itself, the, what's called domestic slavery. So the idea of actual um, slave ownership in New England colonies and states um, meant that there were people enslaved, that there were people building stone walls, that there were people harvesting crops, living, um, running away, um, being beaten, all this was happening in the New England countryside. So this route of Amtrak <laughs> down the coast through Rhode Island, Connecticut, um, I just couldn't look out the window. And, and just very personally, it's like, I love taking the train. I love looking out the window on the Northeast corridor. <laughs> it's relaxing. Oh, shh, can I curse? Yeah, yeah. Oh shit, it's not relaxing anymore, it's fraught. So that was an example of like reorganize the brain and it gets at another dynamic, which is things that I had pleasurable associations with and that were part of what made me happy and that were part of my identity were suddenly um, severely tainted. And that has just continued year by year, month by month, it goes on. You know, I grew up in Brussels for four years of my childhood, four years in age four to eight. And so I grew up in an environment of um, Art Nouveau architecture in Brussels. I'm gonna stop her there. She goes on to talk about the connection between Art Nouveau and, um, and the, the extremely brutal history of Belgium's um, exploitation of what the country now known as the Democratic Republic of Congo under King Leopold. Um, Katrina Brown, uh, she, uh, she made this documentary, Traces of the Trade, which I urge everyone to have a look at if you haven't already, um, in which she invites um, every member of the DeWolf family, every DeWolf descendant that she can find to help her, um, to come with her on this 
journey of historical recovery um, to understand their family's involvement. Um, uh, I, it was a, I'll just say that meeting Katrina um, and meeting Kate and understanding that, you know, these, making these connections to other people doing this work um, made all the difference for me in my own ability as I was trying to uncover what had happened on Cape Cod and make sense of uh, my own findings. And by in emphasizing that, what I want to say is um, it's truly important to work in community, in solidarity, with with others in in doing this work. At one point, um, I said I was going to get personal, um, so I'm showing you a picture of one of my favorite places in the world. Um, this is uh, the center of my childhood universe. This is a meadow. Um, it is um, a place of solace for me. And yet um, it has come to be one of those very fraught spaces that Katrina Brown um, evoked. Can we love a place and yet still hold the knowledge that violence occurred here, that there is a history uh, of violence that we need to uncover, that it is grim and it is painful, but that, but that our love in fact, requires us um, to do this work. And, and it, it, it's a matter of preserving our humanity. Um, I show you this picture because um, this is uh, from, uh, this is a, a space that is beautifully preserved by the Brewster Conservation Trust. I was born in this town. Um, I grew up here. I have deep roots here. Um, and uh, when I was born, um, my mother, chose for me the name Meadow. Uh, people throughout my life have asked me, you know, where does your name come from? Are you, were your parents hippies? And I never really had a good answer to give people. There wasn't, you know, when I asked my mom, she said, well, I want to give you a name that was related to nature. And I opened an atlas and I looked around for place names, but ultimately she went with a common rather than a proper place name. She just thought Meadow sounded pretty. It doesn't make for a great story. So when I was a kid, I used to elaborate and embellish. And but at the age of forty plus, forty five, um, let's say, I had a brutal awakening to my town's deep investment in the slave trade and the and the economy of enslavement. And. I finally realized that I understood the story behind my name. It took a while. Um, I'll walk you through it. Um, in my town, uh, you, you drive around and you'll see uh, Sea Meadow Street, Breezy Meadow, Head of the Meadow. Um, you, you, these are names of places, Meadow this, Meadow that. Um, old Meadow, Sunken Meadow. Um, and the, these are the, the remainders of their, they're like vestiges marking our landscape of, of, of something that existed before. Now the place is covered in trees and sand, you know, but at some point there were a lot of meadows in Brewster. Well, when I had this encounter with a headstone, which is a story for another day, but that really brought me into this work of researching my town's connections to the slave trade. Um, I learned by uh, reading works like Anne Farrow's Complicity um, and those in this growing body of scholarship that you can learn about on our website and the books page of our website, I learned that Places in New England, like Cape Cod, had been clear cut of trees. The, the, the trees had been uh, cut down you know, on Cape Cod from one end to the other. And that, in fact, that timber was shipped down 
to the West Indies, to these plantations that were run on uh, the captive labor of, of these enslaved Africans. That that timber was used to build barrels that could contain the molasses that was produced on those sugar plantations. And that those barrels with our wood were shipped back up to New England. And they were processed right here in Maine, in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island. They were processed into rum. And that that rum was a commodity that was then used to purchase more Africans to fuel this um, most violent of economies. So whereas I had always imagined that my name, Meadow, um, signified an idyllic place, a place of peace, of reprieve, um, almost a magical uh, place of biodiversity and, and life-giving, um, what I came to realize is that the meadows of Cape Cod came to being through an act of great violence violence to the environment, and then the, the violence uh, of this economy that I described for you. Um, that's painful knowledge. Mm. Ramona Peters um, actually asked me not to think about my name in that way, um, which I so appreciate, but I do take it as a personal driving force, um, it is my commitment to digging deep into my identity to understand what is my connection to this history. What is my responsibility to this place, to be a proper steward of this place? What do I need to do? What can I do? What can I bring with what I have that is unique? So here, I'm just gonna, I, I'm just gonna end there. I just wanted to give us um, kind of frame, frame up some ways we, we might think about this. And I'm gonna, I'm gonna hand it off to Kate. Thanks, Meadow. Um, and thank you so much, uh, Jessica, for the invitation to come here today. Um, so I, uh, I'm Kate McMahon. I am a, a museum specialist at the Center for the Study of Global Slavery at the National Museum of African American History and Culture. I'm a native Mainer. I'm from Shapley. Um, and, you know, I'm, I, like Meadow, had a moment of uh, kind of transformation in an archive uh, when I was uh, when I was in graduate school at Howard University. I mean, I had been studying African American history for about a decade, but um, coming across uh, a Mainer indicted for the slave trade set me off on essentially what has become. Um, now my life's work. Um, so I'm going to really move quickly through these first couple of slides because we don't have a ton of time left. Um, and while I talk, I'm just going to run this video, which I hope you all can see. Um, each dot on this video represents a, an individual ship journey, uh, leaving Africa and heading to the new world. A larger dot means the larger number of enslaved people aboard the vessel. And I just want you to watch it over time as I talk. So essentially, um, slavery really created the world that we live in. Um, capitalism was birthed out of slavery. Slavery was one of the first truly global capitalistic endeavors uh, that was undertaken. Um, it began, um, you know, as, as a global enterprise and um, still continues to have resonances in the way that we live, in the world that we live in today. Slavery and colonialism are deeply uh, linked to each other. And so we certainly see that in, a, in much of the world, particularly in Africa, um, for the legacies of both slavery and colonialism in these places. But of course, we experience this every day uh, in the place that we live uh, today. I live in Baltimore. I'm sure many of you are in, most of you are in Maine. Um, 
that that is, you know, something you experience in the landscape and in the environment. Um, and, you know, it still continues to shape uh, the, the, the relationships that we have, the social structures, and of course, racism and white supremacy. Um, you'll know, uh, particularly on the in the table on the left hand side, about 12.5 million people that we know of embarked from Africa. This number is likely much too low. Uh, we truly don't know the full scope of much of the period of enslavement, um, particularly the illegal period after 1808. Uh, we don't have really solid numbers, which I'll get to uh, a little later. Um, and it had a massive human toll. At least 15% of the people that left Africa never made it to the Americas. Um, and that also, that number doesn't account for the number of people that died in Africa on their way to the coasts of Africa uh, to be sold. So there was a, an intra-African slave trade that occurred prior to um, them being sold to European traders. And you can watch here what happens in 1808. Uh, and then the dimensions of the slave trade change and see here, all of a sudden, um, it's heading from East Africa and the, the majority of vessels are going to Brazil and Cuba. So I want you to keep that in mind um, for, for what I'm going to talk about later. Um, Obviously, this has real world um, effects, of course, when you take um, generations of, of young people out of Africa to be sold. This has massive, de you know, demographic destabilization, um, social effects, and of course, these things are still um, present in a lot of the afterlives of slavery that we see across the world. Um, <clears throat> So Maine was involved in the legal slave trade um, as Katrina Brown encountered with her own family that Meta was talking about. Um, Maine was deeply involved in uh, or in the slave trade, although we have trouble uh, assessing its uh, Maine's uh, participation in the legal period. Um, and there's a few major reasons that I've outlined here. Um, number one being that there is simply a lack of research, which is what Atlantic Black Box and other organizations um, and nonprofits and individual scholars are attempting to do is to really dive into this research so that we can understand the facts. Um, there's a misunderstanding of the slave trade. People tend to think that a slave ship was a slave ship and a merchant ship was a merchant ship. And the reality is that there are very few ships that were built specifically for the slave trade. Only a handful um, have survived with, with um, plans that we know of for slave ships. The majority of slave ships were regular merchant vessels that were retrofitted at times to be slave ships. Sometimes those vessels were transporting just one or two or 10 people, other times they were transporting hundreds. Um, and so it really depended upon the passage, which, which direction people were being uh, trafficked in, um, either you know, transoceanic or along the coast. Um, and it also had some other factors um, you know, related to what the vessels were doing at the time. Um, but what has become clear to me in my research is that New England's role in the illicit slave trade, the period after 1808 is significantly larger. Um, so, in 1807, Great Britain abolished its participation uh, participation for its citizens in the slave trade and the United States followed shortly thereafter in 1808. Um, between that time period, there was relative lawlessness. There was little penalty uh, associated with those, that first law that was passed, um, and there was no um, there was no naval force that was designated specifically to be patrolling for Americans involved. They would send out really sort of a scatter shot. Uh, um, attempt at suppressing the slave trade at different times and did a lot of it, these early attempts between 1808 and 1820 via treaties and other sorts of diplomatic actions. Um, <clears throat> but after 1820, uh, when the act of 1820 was passed, which essentially made the slave trade piracy, things really changed. And uh, rather than 
suppress American participation in the foreign slave trade, it seems to have had the opposite effect and it actually dramatically increased. This has a lot to do with the global desire for sugar primarily. Um, and of course, Maine has a significant role in the sugar economy of the 19th century. Maine was one of the largest distillers of rum in the entire country and uh, the second largest importer of sugar in the entire country in the 1850s. So Maine really had a deep, deep connection to, to the Caribbean and South American sugar economies. And uh, there was no such thing as free, free sugar in 1850. All sugar was produced on uh, plantations that used enslaved labor. Um, and this was because it was an absolutely deadly thing to try to cultivate. Um, the mortality rates on uh, sugar plantations are extremely high due to uh, waterborne illnesses, heat, um, you know, injury, snakes and alligators and other kinds of animals that, that live in swamps and live in hot, humid swamps. Um, and of course, they often more likely than not suffered from malnutrition and other types of um, diseases as a result of uh, being on these sugar plantations. So sugar really was a killer crop that was driving a huge amount of, you know, the industrial revolution and our, our global economy. Um, <clears throat> And uh, Mainers really have a big role in, in this period of the slave trade. The two major uh, places that were importing enslaved Africans during the illegal period are Brazil and Cuba. And Mainers really take advantage of this, um, this, this burgeoning market for illicit slave trading, which of course, when you make things illegal, we've all learned from the war on drugs, it often drives the price up. Um, and it and it creates a situation where people are being drawn into this enterprise because of the massive profits that it has, um, ignoring the the devastating human consequences. So uh, one of these these men that engaged in this activity was a man named Ebenezer Farwell. Farwell was from Vassalboro. You see here the house in the image. Uh, that's the house that he grew up in. That's the Riverview House in Vassalboro, which is on the National Register of Historic Places. Um, so Farwell uh, was a ship captain. The Farwell family was a very uh, uh, well-established family of the Vassalboro region, one of the one of the fi uh, fi founders of Vassalboro. Um, and uh, Farwell, by the late 1830s had begun to trade enslaved people in Africa. Uh, in, in, eight, in the late 1830s, he was captain of a ship called the Transit. Um, and uh, as part of that, uh, he essentially went to the west coast of Africa, to Liberia, uh, on behalf of the American Colonization Society, which was a society formed in 1816 by um, members of Congress and others, um, essentially to send free African Americans back to Africa. Uh, this was one of the strategies imposed, uh, one of the many strategies suggested during the lead up to the Civil War as a way to avoid war was to essentially get rid of free black people. Um, some some um, African-Americans left on their own and thought that this was uh, like Martin Delaney who, who went to Liberia and suggested that this was the place that they could make their own free black republic that was free from racism and white supremacy. Uh, but most of the majority of uh, African Americans that end up being sent to Liberia are sent there because they're the plantation owner, the slaveholder had passed away and had manumitted the enslaved people on the plantation as part of his um, will and those people were more often than not in many states not allowed to actually live there. Uh, and so uh, there were laws that said that slaveholders could not um, could not hold, uh, could not free people without <clears throat> having either financial support for them or finding them a place to live. So Farwell goes to Liberia in 1838 and returns uh, in, in New York City 
um, with three enslaved Africans on board. He actually tried to sell three enslaved people in, uh, in, uh, in New York City. And the reason why he was found out was because there was a, a group of free black dock workers that were uh, working along the wharves in New York City who spotted these terrified um, Africans uh, in in the harbor and alerted the port authorities. Uh, Farwell was brought up on charges um, and essentially he argued that um, he he was a innocent. Before he landed in New York, he actually went to Vassalboro and he brought an enslaved person to his father's house in Vassalboro, this house you see here, to work on his father's uh, land as an indentured servant. Now, um, Farwell was eventually acquitted of this charge because he essentially argued that all four men had been manumitted during the Middle Passage. However, they had been purchased as enslaved people in Africa. They had their labor and their movement was forced. So is that really free? This is 60 years after slavery was outlawed in the state of Maine. So this is this is a, 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 a man who uh, not only tried to do this, uh, thankfully Yazid, um, the, the man that was brought to Vassalboro, was brought back to Liberia in subsequent years. Um, uh, but Farwell still makes a ton of money. And as a result of that, he builds this house directly next door to his father's house. Now, these two buildings could not be any different, <laughs> any more different. Uh, this huge Greek revival structure. Uh, and this was a very expensive grand house. So Farwell, as a result of, of having built this house, runs out of money. And so in 1841, he decides that he's going to become captain of a vessel, the schooner Mary Carver. And he takes that vessel in 1841 uh, in, into 1842 and goes back to Liberia, where he had previously landed in an area of Liberia called Little Barabee, which is on the coast of Cote d'Ivoire and, uh, and Liberia. So right on the, on the, um, the border there. And uh, he he comes in contact with a king called Krakow and is attempting to uh, do trade. This is this is where there's a divergence of the historical record. On on the one hand, Vassalboro on uh, Farwell and his uh, descendants say, uh, or his uh, his his wife essentially, uh, and um, the subsequent uh, naval reports that come out about this incident say that he. Uh, was attempting trade, they just say trade, and um, the Krakow and the other um, uh, people that Krakow had brought with him, a group, a small group of people, decided that they didn't like the the trade agreement that he was going, he was attempting to give them, and so they murdered him and sunk the ship and murdered everyone on board. Um, uh, what becomes very clear looking at the chain of evidence from the what he had just previously done in Liberia was that he was there to purchase enslaved people. Uh, and Krakow had also um, done the uh, something similar. There had been a, a, a man, had, a sailor aboard a ship named the Edward Burley had been injured recently by a member of Krakow's party um, after a similar set of circumstances, and that ship was from Boston. So in uh, after Farwell's murder, um, well, they call it a murder. Um, after Farwell is, is killed, he, uh, the United States is in an uproar. You know, they say these, these people, um, you know, murdered, murdered him, murdered the crew, sunk the ship. And so the United States uh, during this time period has, has essentially settled the Webster-Ashburton Treaty with Great Britain, where they agreed to build some US naval ships to begin to patrol the coast of Africa, looking for American slavers that were engaged in this. And one of the first vessels that the, that was launched was the USS Saratoga, which was, which was built at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard and was launched from Kittery um, in July, 1842. Um, and you can see the crew on board. And they proceed to go to 
uh, to Liberia. And they say, this is a document at the Maine Historical Society. And this is one of those fascinating things. Uh, you know, this is like Meadows stumbling upon a grave site. A lot of this stuff is it's just sitting there um, <laughs> waiting for people to discover it. And uh, they state that uh, they were going there for it was to punish the murders of Captain Farwell that our government sent out in 1843, an expedition under Commodore M.C. Perry. So Perry and uh, the Saratoga, as well as a couple of other U.S. naval ships, proceed to go down the coast of Liberia, inviting various kings um, who were uh, living on this coast of Liberia into palaver with them, essentially into to negotiate with them and murder them. They get them in, they get them in uh, a secluded space and they proceed to murder half a dozen kings um, and they raise over a dozen villages. Um, and uh, uh, one of the officers, this is a, his journal here or a, a transcription of his journal. He says, as I was behind the line, I could move about pretty freely and soon became possessed of a very strong desire to shoot somebody, but could not see shot sufficiently certain to expend my charge, knowing that before I could load again, they could be too far off to hit. So I ran towards the natives escaping on our left, but seeing two other natives in the water, it appeared a most beautiful chance and I went to give it to them. I could have loaded and fired frequently for no matter how deep they dived, they would have uh, to come to the surface again to blow. The purser also came along with the intent to kill and we were just drawing bead on them when we learned that they were crewmen from the Macedonian, men who, uh, Africans who worked aboard uh, the, uh, another ship called the Macedonian. So we spared them and who had taken, uh, those who had taken to the water lest they might be mistaken for natives. Uh, and you know this is this is one of these men here. Uh, I'm not sure which men, which man, but this is uh, one of these men in this image. Took wrote this journal about this experience in Africa, and uh, you know we we overlook the the ways in which um, you know the suppression, in particular, some of the suppression of the slave trade was often a colonial action, uh, and a lot of the reason what that they attacked this group of people not was not had nothing to really do with the Mary Carver affair it had everything to do with that this group of people had um, been refusing to allow trade between uh, two colonies in this part of West Africa um, and so you know we can continue to uh, I'm going to wrap up here so we're running out of time um, as I have begun to dig and dig into uh, New England's role in the slave trade, I have found, you know, just massive amounts of evidence uh, for the complicity of Mainers in particular in this activity. Um, and this is just the tip of the iceberg. Everybody you see on this list got caught. So I know only people who got caught, but if in order for, you know, just like the drug trade, there's a whole lot of people who never got caught. Um, and I don't know how big that iceberg is under there. But what I do know is given this list, which I have only about half of the numbers for these vessels, approximately uh, main ships during the period between 1854 and 1862 transported at least 18,000 people between Africa and Cuba. Um, and at least a thousand of those people died during the Middle Passage. Um, and as a result of their, um, uh, the, the amount of money that eventually flowed back to New England um, for this was $11 million a year in the 1850s, which equates to $332 million. So this was a significant amount of Maine's economy and those beautiful houses that Meadow showed you, those were built with the money that was um, made off of the selling and the transportation of enslaved people or goods that were made by enslaved people. And so we really need to rethink our relationship with slavery in Northern New England and try to understand that um, you know, this was not a Southern problem, that this was uh, a United, this was foundational to the United States. So with that, I think we will open up for questions. Um, I'm gonna end my show and stop sharing my screen. Um, and yeah, so does anybody have any questions? So we have a few questions that have come through on the chat. 
Um, and I invite anybody to um, add their questions into the chat so we can read them. Um, so the first question um, is from a teacher, a high school teacher. Um, and she writes that she's interested in links between capitalism and racism as it has evolved historically and continues to affect us today. Are there any resources you could recommend that could be appropriate for middle to high school um, learning? And, you know, yeah. That's yeah, the definitely. The teaching um, tolerance has a really great handbook. Uh, if you go to tolerance.org, I think that's where it is. I'm not sure if it's linked on the Atlantic Black Box website, uh, but I'm sure Meadow can drop it in the chat or one of us can drop it in the chat. That's a really great resource. Um, my museum, the National Museum of African American History and Culture, has the Talking About Race portal, um, which helps, gives a lot of resources for like a wide variety of ages for talking about race and confronting these issues of race. And then the Maine State Museum has um, a, a Maine and Slavery for Teachers um, page on their website, which has a talk that I gave for them over the summer, or maybe it was this winter, I don't know, sometime in the pandemic, <laughs> um, and the, as well as links and um, other resources that they've developed with stuff that's actually from Maine. So so resources and um, archival documents and things that, like that that are in the Maine State Archives or in the Maine State Museum. Yeah, and I would also say that <clears throat> Um, we think that, along with a lot of educators, um, that people learn best by doing. Um, so we, we launched a, a project called um, the 1820 Ship News uh, that we have, um, we rolled it out with students at USM, but um, it is absolutely a project that high school students can um, can be part of, and it involves taking the ship news column of the Eastern Argus newspaper, predecessor to the Portland Press Herald, taking the ship news column, um, so we captured it every time it appeared over the course of the year 1820, of course, the year that, uh, that Maine attained statehood, um, and taking that information about ships arriving at the port of Portland and departing from um, it's about parsing that data, having students actually do the work of learning to read a ship news column to better understand like what was the commerce that drove this economy, right? What was the, what was driving the Maine's maritime, um, Maine's merchant trade at the time? And, uh, you know, we had a really wonderful experience with um, students of Eve Raymond's um, slavery and public history class, um, who did a fantastic job um, and found really uh, some very interesting elements. Um, and the, and very quickly, you know, they discovered uh, quite on their own, we didn't have to preach at them, right? They discovered that such a huge part, I mean, let's just average like half of the the vessels that were doing trade in the port of Portland were doing it with the West Indies so they were returning from the Caribbean or they were headed there um, and the types of cargo they were carrying sugar molasses rum salt cod uh, to feed the enslaved Africans etc so that that you know, uh, contact us if if you're an educator interested in having your students sign on to a project like that. So following up a little bit on that, how um, I guess maybe it's the same answer, but for an organization, a land trust, um, who's has some special places that they they really want to dig into the history they're in, where might they begin their process, or how might they start this? Is Claudia still here? Hey, Cl hey Claudia, hey. I, just, yes. hi. I wonder if you'd be willing to share what you're all up to in Kennebunk. Um, sure. Um, there are about 20 of us from various organizations in town which have joined together. 
um, including the director of the Brick Store Museum, which is an historical museum in town, which has a large number, large archive, um, including like 30 boxes of papers of the Lord family, which were uh, engaged in shipbuilding, um, merchants, um, engaged ship captains. Um, and we're going to be going through and archiving the material in those boxes. Often material has been archived, but no one has wanted to highlight the connections between that material and um, BIPOC individuals, examples of racism, etc. cetera. Um, so people in the past may have known about those connections, but they purposely hidden them. I mean, we've also discovered that there were town records which were destroyed in a fire. Um, periodically, the records get recopied and any references to the existence of slavery or slave trade just get dropped out. Um, but different members of our group have just recently made commitments um, to start doing primary source research that looks at um, connections between um, main merchants and um, the global slave driven economy. Um, the connections between ships that were built in Kennebunk um, and their uh, involvement in the slave trade or slave related commerce. Um, and I'm looking at, we've actually have our town historian has discovered the existence of a freed community of former slaves who lived on a ridge in town and they've gotten, they've had a couple of archeological digs which they've organized. Um, it's state owned land. So they have state archeologists doing this. Um, they've discovered the um, foundations of cabins where these freed slaves lived and artifacts, buttons, pipes, flints, that sort of thing. Um, and one of the people who lived there was um, a slave who played the fiddle. So he was very engaged in the social life of the town and the white histories in Kennebunk um, make a lot of um, you know, his character. And it's done in a kind of a minstrelsy exaggerated way. Um, but I'm really interested in trying to dig up as much information as I can about sort of the narrative of his life. Um, you know, where, where he came from, um, you know, who his different owners were, how did he learn how to play the fiddle? How did he acquire a fiddle? I know that one of his owners in Kennebunk um, was named Littlefield, but his chosen surname was Bassett. Why did he choose that? Well, perhaps Bassett was the name of the person who taught him how to play the fiddle or gave him the fiddle. I just, I have lots of questions about his life, which I'm going to be digging into. We're also looking into indigenous people. Um, and then one last thing, what's really interesting is the white historians in town who've wrote, written these histories talk about how after the 1830s, when the last freed slave um, in this ridge community died, there have been no other permanent black residents in our town. And I'm wondering why is that the case? You know, what mechanisms were in place to keep um, blacks out? Um, was the poor relief law involved? Were there zoning instructions? Was employment in town uh, not available to blacks? Were loans not available to blacks? Would no one sell property to blacks? So there are so many things we can look into and we're really excited to be digging into it. Uh, thank you. Thank you for sharing that. Sure. And we're happy to partner with anybody else in Maine who, um, you know, we're just learning how to do this research. And so we really need, you know, anytime anyone comes up with a tip for how to get at certain kinds of information, um, we, you know, we would love to learn more about how to do this research and to share whatever we learn about how to do this research effectively in Maine. Exactly. And that it's, uh, thank you, Claudia. And it's sure. such a powerful example of um, the kind of, you know, coalition and, and partnership um, that I was um, describing before, you know, people with different skills, um, with different interests, with, you know, um, 
you know, a pastor, a librarian, a school teacher, an anti-racist activist, um, you know, all coming together to share knowledge and help enlighten one another, you know, and so on a that's that's exactly what we want to encourage at the local level. And then Atlantic Black Box exists to connect all of those different, right, communities that are, are forming so that we can get a higher level kind of, um, you know, convergence uh, for sharing that information through a dynamic platform. Um, so I'll just mention too, you know, that for folks who are looking to commit to um, understanding place through the lens of racial history, I would um, strongly you know, encourage you to connect with Atlantic Black Box, which you can easily do on our website. There's a connect with us button. Um, and uh, we will be um, fairly soon uh, starting a, a membership program. When you become a member, you then have access to a um, recurring regular um, series, a research forum where we bring in scholars like Kate, uh, researchers like Vana Carmona, who's here tonight, who's got a tremendous amount um, to contribute to this conversation about um, Maine's uh, you know, hidden histories. Um, and I'll ask you to do that in a sec, Vana. Um, but the, you know, what, so I think step number one is acknowledge we have a problem, right? Like with any kind of recovery project, acknowledge the extent of the problem we're facing, acknowledge the extent of our ignorance, right? That no one person, not even a, you know, a real crack historian, we can't rely on you know, a handful of scholars to do this work. We have to do it ourselves. We are the people we've been waiting for <laughs> and for, for far too long. Um, so we've got to enlighten ourselves. We have to educate ourselves. Best way to do that is, um, is by working together. Um, so Vana, do you wanna talk about um, your own research? Sure, am I on music, can you hear me? Okay, I have another one of those that one day I uh, had that epiphany where I was walking around in a cemetery uh, where so many of my family is buried. My, um, I've had people in Maine since 1633 and I think the newcomers came in 1732. And, uh, my grandmother was a great historian, but there were a few things that she never shared. And I found that one day in the cemetery about seven and a half years ago, where I found a gravestone for someone that had it would mention our family last name, but I didn't know who he was. And I don't know if I should admit this, but I thought, well, he was either a child that died in infancy or maybe it was his favorite horse. Honest to God, I really honestly thought that. It turned out that my family had enslaved a number of people. And uh, it hit me about a day later when I started digging around. And that started me on my project, which was to find out more about these people and then other people. And then the next thing I know, I have a database of 1,700 people of color in Maine prior to 1800. So, um, I, I did not have any um, outside support for this project. It was all from my heart. And so I learned the hard way how hard it was. So Claudia, whom I'm going to be talking with in the next few days, uh, you know, to try to find out who was the, the fiddle teacher. Oh, honestly, if you can find that person, I really want to hear about him. Uh, the information prior to 1800 is very scant. I'm always sometimes grateful that I even find that someone existed. I don't even know if they're male or female. I just know that they existed. So, and I'm concerned that if I don't put them on my list now, another generation goes by and they won't even have that. So uh, the early research is, is very difficult and you have you're, you're clutching at straws the whole time you can go through all the standard uh, census reports etc but at the end of the day you find something and you just follow it 
get a thread and you just follow it. And you'd be surprised where that sometimes can take you. Um, but anyway, um, eventually, a couple of years ago, people started asking me more about what are you doing? And uh, it, it grew in, and I was kind of, was surprised. Uh, I'm very happy that people are starting to be interested in this and that it's growing. And I'm grateful for Kate and Meadow and everybody who really wants to jump in and, and share what they have because, um, you know, a few years ago, it wasn't like that. Yeah, and we have a couple of questions. Um, folks in the chat are, um, are saying, you know, really interesting, but what about the land trust question or, you know, the advertised subject was about reading the landscape through the lens of racial history. I'm just um, gonna say goodbye. Well, <laughs> I have to so out, it was really lovely. And um, thank, thank you, you. for sticking around. <laughs> like, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't hear the last part of that. Oh, I was, um, so there are a couple folks in the chat who are saying, um, yes, uh, but what about, what can a land trust do? And what's, what's the role of a land trust in this process of historical recovery? And um, the first thing that I would say is um, you are well positioned um, in the community. Um, you are not an independent researcher such as Vana or myself or, or Claudia. Um, you are an organization that has some um, you know, that, that is respected uh, for doing important work and that has clout. Um, so you already have, um, you know, a, a base to work from in terms of outreach to other partners who can help you yeah. do the research that will enlighten, you know, you as to what happened here. I'm thinking specifically about your historical society and about your library and about your town hall. I mean, it depends from town to town, but I know in mine, um, it's the town hall that keeps uh, the church records going back to 1700, et cetera. But the, so step one is to identify um, where the archive, you know, who are the gatekeepers, who um, holds the archive and to do that outreach, connect with them, try to form a, a, a collective commitment to doing this work. Um, did you have an idea, Vana? Uh, yeah, I think that it's very good. Uh, well, first you start with the regular things, you know, census reports, et cetera. But eventually it really is following the thread. If you, sometimes I have found that if you find when you find the name of an enslaver, it has often helped to, to study him or her. And in studying him or her, you it will take you to some places that you will be surprised. It'll, you'll discover connections with other families who also enslaved. You'll discover, um, oh, I don't know, you might even find ships. But don't ever think that, oh, I've got to follow the enslaved person. Sometimes you follow the enslaver and that will take you to other people who were enslaved or other people who were complicit. So, you know, all of this I kind of, you know, learned on, learned by um, trying, learned by doing it. Well, this... I, I just want to thank every uh, thank you, Claudia and Vana, for joining in. This has made it really real, and and I appreciate your stories and um, your experience. Um, uh, I think um, that for what I'm hearing and what I think, you know, as we move forward for those in this group who are working with their land trusts on this effort in this conversation, it I I really appreciate what you said, Meadow, about connecting with other partners in the town mm -hmm. that would be, you know, would, would have more direct access, may, may know someone who knows something, may, you know, there may be things um, that will 
directly lead us to some place on a property that we have or so I just I think I think all of that together you know and we're learning as we go how to do this and part of it is it's not going to be a straight line you know we're just sort of figuring it out and we know that there are other people doing this that we can come together with on Atlantic Black Box so yeah. oh Hadley yeah hi yes I'm loving this conversation the, the learning and the ideas are just endless um and I would just throw in that Another, I, one of the land trusts I work for, Western Foothills Land Trust, is starting to do some of this research in our region. And not specifically related to the slave trade, we're doing more ours on the Abenaki and Wabanaki history of our region. Oh, cool. Um, but what we've done is partner, I mean, loosely partner with Bates College and found a history professor that had a student that was looking for a research project because we just don't have the capacity right now but we're working with this student trying to find grant money for a stipend to pay her for her research. And she is doing, she's a, a student of history. So she mm. is learning the techniques and she's starting to do the research with and for the land trust um, as a collaboration between her studies and our interests in learning the history of, of the land that we manage. So just another possible avenue for other land trusts that may not have staff capacity to become historians <laughs> like us. Absolutely. Also, if there are land trusts out there that want to know a little bit more about anything in their area, by all means, call me or email me or whatever. Um, I'd be happy to share what I may have found out. Now, Vanna, could you put your email address in the chat for everyone? It's really easy. It's Vanna Carmona at gmail.com. That's one of the advantages of having an unusual name. Let me see if I can put that in there. Okay. That's super Hadley. Do, do others have questions? I'm happy to stick around and keep chatting. Um, I'd love to hear what your, what, what challenges you think you might be facing on the ground where you are. Is that directed to? I'm sorry. Any no, just I'm I'm asking folks in the you know um, in the audience participants. Okay. I know how I feel about that. <laughs> there was there was a question that came in the chat that's not directly related to that, but I want to um, represent it, and that is: Are there sugar companies that are still selling sugar? now that can be traced back to the slave trade? Um, so, you know, here in Portland, um, there's the, the Baked Beans Company um, right there at Back Cove, which, you know, um, has been a long, you know, around uh, over 150 years. Uh, and, and, and so the molasses that goes into baked beans, you know, um, are this, this favorite sort of brown bread baked beans combination that I grew up eating, you know, as a child of people from the Boston area, um, that has direct ties to this history. Um, and I mean, that would be an interesting, the, the connection of, of, of that particular um, company to, to this history. I haven't looked into it myself, but any, anything that is you know, has molasses as a primary ingredient um, is connected to uh, this history of complicity. May I share, a, a, this, is, this is just a, kind of a, a story that I found about my family, but uh, the man that I discovered first who had been uh, purchased by my family, uh, he, they had, uh, someone in the family, a nephew had asked if this man who was a merchant could just get somebody to help them out, you know, pick somebody up in the West Indies when he, next time he's down there. And that is how this gentleman prince arrived in Portland in the first place. But there is a story that to pay for him, he actually had to carry the, the shooks, the things that they used to make barrels that one of his first jobs that he had to do was to carry the shooks to 
the ship that was going down to the West Indies to actually pay for him. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's true, but I wouldn't be surprised if it is. Mm -hmm. So yeah, here you are, you're being enslaved to actually do the labor to help pay for you in the first place. I don't know, it's a terrible story, but um, yeah. that's what I heard them. Well, so Madison is saying we manage land, but do not own it. So there are many different layers for us to navigate. Is there anyone else out there navigating this? Um, and I would say, you know, layers is absolutely the, the right um, kind of way to frame this. There are so many layers. Um, and, and clearly the, the first one, you know, um, has to do with the indigenous history. That is, that is the first layer necessarily. And we didn't talk about this, but you know, uh, and this is, this is not widely discussed, um, though I'm happy to see it kind of um, appearing more on people's radars. Slavery in the United States, uh, you know, in North America began with indigenous enslavement. Yes, and so there's no way to, you know, in these, these communities, the, the captive Africans, the, you know, the um, African descended peoples who came to this region um, and the indigenous populations who were native to this area, uh, there, was, there, was, there, were, there were a lot of relationships, intermarriages, et cetera. There's no way to separate out these histories. We are necessarily um, looking at you know, different layers and, and layers that, that combine. Um, yeah, did you want to say something? Yeah. And, the, and the one last thing um, is that I, I you know, I'm, I'm certainly not an expert in, you know, land trust, um, you know, by any means. I, um, I'd love to know more about you know, your work and the very particular challenges that, that you face. And, um, but, but I will say, I mean, often what I've seen is that often, you know, um, th th these properties are gifted, um, bequeathed, um, you know, and, 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 and then conserved. Um, I mean, <laughs> there's, a pr I think one problem that we're not talking about is looking a gift horse in the mouth you know, um, where, for example, the, you know, I showed you that image of my favorite place, the meadow, um, that piece of land belonged to the um, pre preeminent uh, sea captain of my hometown, the founding father of my hometown, who was involved deeply in the slave trade. And then it passed through many hands. And now it's this wonderful public garden, you know, gorgeous space with trails in the woods going down to the bay. And, but nowhere is the lineage of, you know, uh, that property um, described, you know, it, it, it doesn't go back that far. It mentions, you know, the, that in, indigenous people you know, farmed on that land uh, from from very early times, but it sort of skips over this whole other period of, of history that would acknowledge dispossession of the land and that would acknowledge uh, how that land was actually purchased with what with what funds. And these are hard questions to grapple with, really <laughs> hard, right? Um, so I think if we if we keep talking, you know, that's how we make progress. Anyway, thank you so much, Jessica. This has really been. Uh, privilege. Thank you. Thank you so much, Meadow. And thank you for, for um, taking this extra time to be, you know, answering questions. So right, you know, right in the work that we're all involved in. And I really appreciate that. And so I think just one last, if folks want to continue this conversation with you through Atlantic Black, Black Box, they just go to the website and sign up and then, and then they're in, right? Absolutely. And, uh, you know, it, it sometimes takes us a while to get back to you, um, but we will, and we'll be thrilled that you're part of the network and there will be multiple ways to engage. Yeah. 
Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Meta. Thank you everybody for joining tonight. Um, I'll follow up with the recording and um, yeah, thank you. Thank you for being in this work with us. Thank you so much. Thanks, Mona and Claudia. Bye. Good night. Thank you.